Okay, everybody, here we are at lesson four. We're going to talk about measuring variability. So we're going to talk about standard deviations and interquartile range, or IQR. But we're also going to talk about box plots. I know a couple of y'all noticed, hey, we mentioned them. We didn't talk about much. Uh, using uh, the information we have about IQRs, we're going to build some box plots. So here are our objectives. We're going to talk about standard deviation, quartiles, five number summary, and then that bit about box plots. So the standard deviation. Uh, so we want to know kind of on average roughly how much each of the observations uh, are uh, far away from uh, the mean in a population. So you're going to take every single observation subtract uh, the, the mean from the population. Square that difference because we want all those differences to be positive. And divide by the number in the population. Most of the time we are not able to find the population standard deviation because we don't have all observations in a population. So we're going to use the sample standard deviation. So we use s, I have s of x here. Here we use the Greek letter sigma there we go. And so you're going to go ahead, take the difference of every single observation and that sample mean, square that difference. But one difference here is we're going to divide by the sample size minus one. So every single data point that we have in our sample has a deviation from the mean. So whatever that sample mean is, every single observation has some distance from that sample mean. And that's what we are talking about, a deviation here. If you add all the deviations together, they should add to zero because some observations are higher than the mean, some are lower than the mean. When you add all the deviations together, you'll get zero. So we're going to go ahead. We're going to calculate it by hand for a very small data set. We're not going to be doing this for large data sets. Um, we just want you to really kind of get together um, the idea that we're doing, uh, why we're doing it. So we have a group of four children. We went ahead, we asked them the number of pets they own. So like child one said they own one pet. Child two said they have three. Child four said they have eight. So they have a very big household. Better? Lots of fish. So I went ahead and XI, I put each of those observations in there. So there's four observations, so I get four, uh, four rows. Then my second step here, calculate, oops, so my, so then my first step is going to be calculate the sample mean. So x bar is equal to, I'm going to have one plus three plus four plus eight, and there are four children. So I'm going to end up getting 16 over 4. Definitely feel free to double check that. So it should be 4. So on average, these four children said that they have four pets. So I'm going to just plug that in here. So then calculate each deviation. That is this, this uh, column right here. So 1 minus 4, so 1 minus 4, that's going to be negative 3. 3 minus 4, negative 1. 4 minus 4, this one's always my favorite, it's just 0. 8 minus 4, going to be 4, positive 4. So step 3. Square each deviation, so these are my deviations right here. So I'm going to have negative 3 and square it. Anytime you square a negative number, you get positive, so I'll get positive 9. Negative 1 squared, just going to get positive 1. 0 squared, like I said, this one's my favorite row here, it's just 0. And then 4 squared, it's going to be 16. So that was step three. Step four, we're going to find the average um, by, we're going to add all of these values 
and we're going to divide by n minus 1. So n is equal to 4, so n minus 1 is equal to 3. So this step is going to look like 9 plus 1 plus 0 plus 16 divided by 3. Going to get something like 26 divided by 3. It's about 8.667 uh, pets. Okay, and then we still have one more step. So, step 5, we need to go ahead and square root what we have here. So, square root, I'm still going to just have 26 over 3 because it's exact. It's going to be something like 2.944 pets. So, these children had an average of four pets um, in their household, but it varied on average um, about 2.944 pets. So the standard deviation, we are not going to do this by hand in this class. There is a, a video that will show you how to calculate it on the TI-84 or 3. Um, technology makes it a lot easier. You're absolutely not going to want to do this by hand when you have 50 observations. Honestly, you almost never want to do it by hand when you have more than five. Uh, it's very, very easy to make an error by hand. So you can go ahead. Here's a TI-84 screen. You are going to want the one that says SX, not this one that has a sigma. You want this one. So this is saying, okay, well, the standard sample standard deviation here um, for this sample here is 11.97%. So on average, uh, it looks like the uh, there was an average of 76% um, across all the states. Uh, um, students stayed their first year in their state, and the average... Um, it varied on average about 11.97%. So here's a write up there. The percent of students who stay in state for their first year of college for the 50 states varies on average 11.97%. And definitely check this out. It is your friend. You have a data set that's more than like five or so uh, observations. You're definitely going to want to use technology to help you out. So then another way we talk about spread are the quartiles and the uh, IQR. So one thing to know is X bar is influenced by if you have skewness or if you have outliers and you use X bar to calculate the standard deviation. So if the sample means no good, the standard deviation is no good. So we have what we call the interquartile range. So you define it by the Q3 minus Q1, so the third quartile minus the first quartile, and it represents the middle 50% of our data. So just kind of defining here, the first quartile is this value where 25% of observations fall below it. We have a second quartile, we call it the median, 50% fall below it. And then the third quartile, 75% fall below it. That kind of idea. So it's okay if you write Q1 um, or Q with a 1 bigger. It's not going to make a big difference to us. So just think first quarter of the data is below it. Third quartile, so the third quarter, or 75% is below. So now we have the 20 New York commute times, because it's a lot more manageable than that uh, data set of 50% uh, percents, um, for students. We want to find the first and third quartile. So remember when we folded in half for our to find our median? So we said, hey, there's 20 of this. So we folded in half. We had 10 on each side. And here's our median. Now we're going to take each half and fold in half again. That's what we're going to do. So I have 5 here, 5 here, 5 and 5, that kind of idea. 
So my median is 22.5 minutes. So I take this first half and I basically find the median of just the first half. That is going to be our first quartile. So because there's an even number, I have to average the middle two. So I have to average 15 and 15. That's going to come out to 15. So my first quartile is 15 minutes. That means 25% um, of the observations fall below that, that point. To find my third quartile, I'm going to split the second half of the data in half. So I have to average 40 and 45. So I'm going to get 42.5 minutes for my third quartile. So now that we have those, we have what we call a five number summary. So I had 15 minutes was my first quartile. And keep in mind, it is important to keep your units. If you have units, you should include them here. The median here was 22.5 minutes. So 22 and a half minutes. My third quartile was 42.5 minutes. And then for our five number summary, it also wants the minimum. So just the lowest observation observed. So these are in order. So five, five minutes. And then the maximum. So the largest value observed, so 85 minutes. So this would be my five number summary for this data set. I have a min of five minutes, first quartile is 15 minutes, median is 22.5 minutes, third quartile is 42.5 minutes, and my max is 85 minutes. And what this does is it gives me a good, just short summary of center of spread. It's still very important to look at the data, to put them into a plot. So here, this is quantitative, maybe a histogram, a stem plot, or um, maybe a box plot, but uh, this alone is not going to be enough. You're going to need to know what, what the data look like. So absolutely, this five number summary, that is something you can do um, using a, a calculator as well. So for box plots, finally introducing them here. So it is a type of plot for quantitative variables. So we're going to focus for quantitative variables in this class on histograms, stem plots or stem and leaf plots, and box plots. Those three are going to be the three we really focus on. It uses a lot of information from that five number summary to make the plot. It displays outliers by using what we call the one and a half times IQR rule, which we will go into. This box here, since the lower part of the box is the first quartile and the upper part of the box is the third quartile, it represents the middle half of your data. So that's our IQR. And it's really good for comparing multiple groups. Okay, outliers and the one and a half times IQR rule. So this rule helps us find out what values are outliers, what values should just be points that are by themselves on a box plot. So we have a lower cutoff, which is Q1, so our first quartile, minus one and a half times to Q, IQR. Anything lower than this point is a low outlier. So anything lower is going to be equal to a, a low outlier. Versus our upper cutoff, anything above this. So any above, this is going to be a high outlier. And there are no guarantees. There don't have to be outliers. But this is really helpful finding them when we do have them. So we're looking at that data set of um, students uh, percent that stay in state their first year of college. There are 50 observations in here, which is a lot. And we're going to try and calculate our cutoffs to find out if we have outliers in this data set. So things that we'll need. We'll need Q1, we'll need Q3, and we'll need an IQR. We need all, all three of these things to, to find the, uh, the uh, 
the cutoffs. So for me, I'm really, really visual to light. light, light um, I like to lay all of this out. That doesn't look like it's cut in half. If I have 50 observations, this is my 25th, this is my 26th. This is going to be my 13th. So I'll have 12 observations here, 12 here. And then uh, my 38th. Obviously, you are welcome to check, but I'll have 12 here, 12 here. So my first quartile is going to be my 13th observation. And we're not testing you on doing this. By all means, go ahead, write out all the numbers. Um, I've had a lot of practice doing this, so I was able to see it a little earlier. So my 13th observation, just start at the bottom here. This is my first, second, third, fourth, fifth, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. So this is 70%. Q3 is going to be uh, my 38th observation here. So that's going to be quite a bit here. So you can either work backwards or work forwards, either way. So I'm going to go ahead and just count. I'll probably skip ahead here. Okay, so our 38th observation here is going to be 83. I'm just translating my, my stem plot backwards. So my IQR is going to be 83 minus 70%. Well, they're both in percents, so 13. So I have everything I need to set this up here. It's not set up yet. So my lower cutoff, it's going to be Q1 minus one and a half times IQR. Okay, so my lower is going to be Q1 minus one and a half times IQR. So it's going to be getting reset. Um, 70 minus 1.5 times 13. Oops. So that will eat. I go ahead and do this math here. 70 minus uh, 19 and a half. Always do your multiplication before your addition or subtraction. And that will equal 50.5. So this means any observations in this data set, so in this one, that are below 50.5 are going to be outliers. So here I don't have anything that's 50, but I do have a 36 and a 44. Those are going to be low outliers. And then for a upper cutoff, sorry, I didn't leave a whole lot of room here. It's going to be Q3 plus one and a half times IQR. So 83 plus that one and a half times 13. So. 83 plus 19 and a half. I can tell right out, right here, this is going to add to over 100%. So um, you get, yes, my, my cat likes to talk, but uh, 102.5%. So any state that had over 102.5% of their students stay in state are, are considered an outlier. So we just cut off, cut off to 100 Anything above 100%, not going to happen. We have no high outliers. Okay, so similar type of problem, different example. Now going back to that New York commuter time example. So remember, we had 20 observations. Our first quartile was 15 minutes. Third quartile was 42.5 minutes, which makes our IQR 27.5. So the IQR, just as a reminder, is Q3 minus Q1. So 42.5 minus 15, and that's where that 27.5 minutes comes from. So then I want to find what values would observations in the, um, this data set be considered an outlier. So we want to find the cutoffs. So just setting it up, 
going to go ahead here. This is my lower cutoff. So implying that anything below negative 26.25 minutes is considered an outlier. So unless you, you know, commute to work with a time machine, it, this isn't going to be possible. We're not going to have low outliers. And then an upper cutoff. So anything above this value, if you plug in, do the math, looks like anything above 83.75 minutes, that'll be considered an outlier. And looking here, it does look like we have one high outlier. So just to summarize, any value less than 26.25 minutes, which is impossible, um, or greater than 83.75 minutes is considered an outlier here. So now we want to go ahead, use this information, put it together so we can construct a box plot. So here we want to construct our box plot. So it's really, really important to have Q1, our median, Q3. These parts are the box themselves. But we're also really going to want our max. We're going to want our min. And we're also going to really want to pay attention to what's our lowest value that's a, not an outlier and what's our highest value that's not an outlier. So here, there's my mean, median, my quartiles. So this here is going to be my min. Note that we don't have any low outliers. Our max is going to be an outlier, but 65 isn't. So that's going to be a cutoff for our whisker there. So first thing we do, we're going to make the box. So that's going to be Q1. That's our median. Q3. So this is our lowest non-outlier. Here, it's also our min. So the min is just the lowest observation. It doesn't matter if it's an outlier or not, it's just the lowest observation. This right here is our highest non-outlier. So if you look in our data set, the highest value in our data set that isn't an outlier is 65. And then this is an outlier and this is the maximum. So keep in mind the min or max, it doesn't matter if it's an outlier or not, um, but the end of these whiskers are going to be the highest and lowest non-outliers. And it's probably going to be labeled. Okay, so then just a few um, pointers like box plots versus histograms because both of them are used very, very frequently when uh, you have large data sets. So both of them are really helpful for large data sets. And I, by large, we usually mean 30 or more observations. Uh, histograms, they're going to give us more information about size. Like I know it's more shaped like this versus if you look at a box plot, it's really, really difficult to tell what it's shaped like. It doesn't give you information about the number of peaks, for example. And so uh, histograms, it could be more difficult to see outliers. Here, if you look here, it's really, really obvious there's an outlier. It's, it's less obvious in this histogram that it's an outlier. So the box plot, you can see all the quartiles and the median clearly, but it's hard to tell number of peaks. So there's some uh, trade-offs there. Definitely feel free to pause if you need a little more time uh, to record all of these right here. So choosing me measures of center and spread. So in general, okay, so choosing measures of center and spread. In general, you're going to either have x bar and the standard deviation together, or you're going to have the median and the IQR together. You're not going to mix and match. It's pretty much going to be one of those combos. So if we have a skewed distribution or distributions that have extreme outliers, 
we don't want to use the mean. So we don't also we also don't want to use the standard deviation. You're going to use the median and the quartiles. Know that the median and the quartiles, they're always good. <laughs> um, but the sample mean and sample standard deviation are our favorite when it's appropriate to use them. So if our data are approximately symmetric, you don't have extreme outliers, you we're going to want to use the mean and the standard deviation. Absolutely, you don't want to use just the numerical summary, so the five number summary is great, but you really should plot your data so you know what they look like. Uh, it gives you a lot more information than just the five number summary. So always plot your data. So just a couple things to consider. So true or false, a uh, standard deviation can be negative. This one's going to be false. So when calculating, we square this, the deviations and the result is always going to be positive, or at least, you know, it's never going to be negative. So that was xi minus x bar squared. When we square in here, that forces whatever is under that square root, it can't be negative. And then two, a standard deviation can be zero. So while this isn't likely, it is possible. So when all the values are exactly the same, the data set will have zero spread. So here, if I have four observations, five, 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 this means that my mean is going to be five and all of my deviations. So I'm going to have five minus five squared plus five minus five squared, and I'm going to have that four times. Well, I'm going to have zero plus zero plus zero plus zero over three. So it's going to end up being zero. So a standard deviation means zero spread. That only happens when you have exactly the same value for all observations, which is really unlikely, but possible. So your turn. I wanted to make sure that y'all had a chance to see these examples. Uh, these are example problems for you to go ahead and work out. So from the data set above, calculate the mean for exam score or the mean for GPA, that kind of idea. And most of these, if I see correctly, a lot of them will have a video solution. So you will not just be practicing, but you'll have a practice with an answer that you can check. I strongly recommend these. Uh, anytime we include them, we, we definitely try to get uh, solutions to y'all. So it's your turn. Give it a try and look forward to hearing from you on the discussion boards.